Hello and good evening. My name is Amanda Brayson and I work on the programming team here at TIFF Cinematheque. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to tonight's screening of The Last Days of Disco. Yes, with writer-director Whit Stillman. Absolutely. To begin, we would like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the Treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are so very grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community and on this land. On behalf of TIFF, I would also like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and TIFF Cinematech's public supporters, Ontario Creates, and the Canada Council for the Arts. Thanks as well to Classic FM Radio and Zoomer Radio, our program sponsors. As a charitable organization, we would also like to thank our donors and members for making TIFF's year-round programming and educational and community outreach initiatives possible. So tonight, we are so very thrilled to welcome writer-director Whit Stillman, who will join us for a Q&A following the screening of the director's final installment of his doomed Bourgeois in Love trilogy. Yes. Presented tonight on a 35 millimeter print from TIFF's very own film reference library screening collection. So, Whit Stillman grew up in New York and graduated from Harvard College. After stints in publishing and journalism, he wrote and directed five films. Metropolitan, Barcelona, The Last Days of Disco, Damsels in Distress, and Love and Friendship. He's also written two novels. The Last Days of Disco with Cocktails at Protestian Afterwards, which won the Prix Fitzgerald in 2014, and Love and Friendship in which Jane Austen's Lady Susan Vernon is entirely vindicated. Please join us following the screening for a Q&A with Whit Stillman, and in the meantime, please enjoy The Last Days of Disco. Please join me in welcoming Whit Stillman. So, Wit, thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, thanks for doing this. Uh, so I actually wanted to start off tonight's conversation. Um, for those who might not know in the audience, The Last Days of Disco actually celebrated its 20th anniversary just this past year. Yeah. And I wanted to see, by a show of hands, how many of you watched it for the very first time tonight? Amazing. That's almost half. And the people who walked out also. We, we include them, yes. So, Wit, I actually wanted to start off um, because people know you as both a director and a writer because you've written your first five feature films as well as two novels. Um, but I was surprised to learn that actually you started out originally wanting to be an author. So I was hoping you can talk a little bit about that transition from writing fiction to writing film. Well, I was sort of hopeless. Um writing fiction, so it was easy to abandon it. Uh, I remember I had a, a day job at Doubleday Publishing Company, and I was living in the East 50s in Manhattan. I was trying to write these sort of elaborate comic uh, short stories. Um, my conceit in writing short stories was to have a very silly first person narrator telling a story, but I had to establish that the very silly person wasn't me. And so there would be sort of a framing mechanism and it would take me forever to do these stories. And a building was going up. I mean, here in Toronto, you have all these buildings going up. And I was watching one story of the building after another going up while I was still working on one, one story of mine. And it just seemed so pathetic. And so, um, I thought I have to get into something else where it's not just my words that's going to do it. Some, some, someone needs to help. I need actors and a camera to help. So um, I was trying to sort of think of how to get into audiovisual media. So how much when you first, uh, when you go to camera, how much of the script is really fleshed out? And how much do you depend on the actors to bring to it? Well, um, when I started out, we sort of treated the script as if it was holy grail and um, we could shorten things and we would change things when we had to. So for instance, in the first film, Metropolitan, um, 
sort of late at night in New York, we realized they didn't really have clearance for quoting from a book called Girls and Sex by Dr. Wardell B. Pomeroy. So I wrote another version, alternate version, by a different author. And they, the actors had to do both scenes. And the next day, we called up the Kinsey Center for Sex Research in San Francisco and got permission to do Dr. Wardell Pomeroy's uh, book. Um, but so there's sort of innovation just to fix problems in those scripts. And in the case of um, Barcelona, the second film, there was wild innovation when we got the idea of a prig joke. Um, uh, there's a, a prig joke in it that I hadn't thought of before, so I shot it both ways because I was so insecure about varying from the script that we show it the script way and then the new way and try to figure out how to put it together in the editing room. And then really working with two good executives at Amazon Studios um, in doing this pilot for the Cosmopolitans in 2014, they kept saying things like, can we have more scenes with Chloe Sevigny? Uh, and so I'd get up at 4 a.m. to write a Chloe Sevigny uh, scene using things from another script for the second episode and, and things like that. And then with this film we showed last night, uh, Love and Friendship, we f had this really funny uh, actor, Tom Bennett, and uh, kind of an unfleshed out part. And so. I just loved him so much, kept writing scenes for him. And so now um, we don't really ad lib, um, but uh, I try to you know, add things as, as needed. Uh, I'm so glad you were talking about Love and Friendship, which also stars Kate Beckinsale and Chloe Sevigny. Um, in the last days of disco, you know, their friendship really just pops off screen. So it's so um, like honest and also uh, believable, really. But it's what's so amazing to me is that they were actually so very young when you yeah, were filming. Yeah, that was great. So what was it like working with actors of that age and experience level? And did they bring anything to the roles that surprised you? Well, both of them, um, sometimes we get credit for sort of promoting people, but actually every, everyone we sort of used has had a big head of steam before we got to use them. So Chloe had made a big mark in Kids and, and other films, and Kate in Britain, um, too. Uh, and um, it was just wonderful having the actual age of the parts. And, um, uh, and then also, you know, they're still very young now, so, um, you know, long careers ahead of them. And uh, what, did, what was your question after all? Well, I think that the tack on question was if they brought anything that surprised you to those roles at such a young age. Um, <clears throat> Well, I'm not sure if you're looking for big surprises. Uh, when you cast people in a film, you sort of want them to do what's indicated. Um, uh, you know, Chloe has this wonderful naturalness of just existing. And in a kind of underwritten role, I mean, the Alice part in the film is sort of underwritten. It's kind of a reflexive role where, or, or, where we, she reflects what thoughts we might have on her. And um, Chloe has this wonderful thing she does with her eyes. Uh, it's really beautiful. And she just exists in the moment. Um, and I think it's deceptive for people. Like when I was showing it to some people, they seem to think that, you know, Kate is this brilliant, great actress. And Chloe is an amateur who just sort of stumbles into the film. And actually, they're both completely different how they go about things. But they're getting, I think, both the sensational results. And so it's sort of good that Kate is the character with all the dialogue. I mean, it's amazing the way she, uh, that, that scene where uh, they're in the ladies' room after um, she has sort of accused um, uh, Chloe of having, uh, Alice of having a venereal disease. She and outed she outed her. And, and she goes to justify herself. I mean, that dialogue, to be able to put that across. Uh, so, um, I didn't want to be surprised, and I wasn't. I, I got what, what I was looking for. And she also has a British accent as well, which in the film, you know, she uses an American accent. So for dialogue-heavy parts, what type of coaching do you kind of get yourself involved with to I, transfer? I, I, um, I cast... It was one of the only times I wrote um, a part for an actor um, that I hadn't worked with. Um, 
And I'd seen her in Cold Comfort Farm, which is Jane Austen derived. And she was absolutely, Kate was sensational in that. And so she auditioned for it um, on tape. I hadn't met her really brilliantly. And um, she was, she's very good with accents. And she works with accent coach. There's a late accent coach we work with. And, um, and the one thing I did notice was that in doing an accent, pitch goes up sometimes. And so her pitch went up. And the sound equipment was just coming in where you could change pitch. So a couple things when it seemed like too hard in the ears, we would lower the, um, you can't lower it too much or they sound like men or hybrid. Um, so that's how we worked on that. But she was just great at that. And it made, as Sabsher is playing American. Um, I also wanted to take a minute to talk about the fashion in the film as well, uh, because it's so elegant and tailored, and yet it kind of shies away from the stereotypical disco fashion of the era that kind of lives in the popular imagination. So I wanted to know how you approached this film, either working with or against disco as a trend. We, we wanted to sort of get over the idea of disco being polyester and really kind of weird, bad 70s fashions. So our idea was it would be early 80s when sort of the look changed and became cooler, new wave and things like that. And I went through fashion magazines in the period, in the years you know, up to the early 80s and before the early 80s, finding things that look good to our eyes uh, when we were making the film in 97. And so it's just a choice of those few things that we thought still looked really good. And it gives a kind of odd thing that doesn't seem too period. I sort of don't like films when you get the impression, oh man, they're really doing period. So if it's a 1950 film, like everything in their apartment is bought in 1950. When that wouldn't be the case, you'd have some old furniture from other eras. And so we tried to do sort of soft period. I especially love uh, Kate Beckinsale's cutout dress. I thought I that was that such one. a elegant yeah. touch. We had a um, someone who was very well trained uh, costume designer, but there's one of her first big jobs. I can think it was her first big job, Sarah Edwards. She's gone on to do many, many things. And we had a problem because there's competing disco film. So there was, um, I think the director was Mark Christopher, and he was doing the Studio 54 film with Miramax. And we kept hearing that they were not going to do that film. And we were like, phew, they're not going to do it. And then we heard they're going to do it. And I didn't worry so much about it, but I knew Cast Rock that was backing us really wanted our film to be first. So we had to go and shoot the film before I'd really finished the script, before we'd finished casting. And casting was just crazy. And um, Tom McCarthy is a very good director, is a very good actor. He was supposed to play the Tom part. And then... Um, uh, Joanne Woodward wouldn't let him out of the sort of summer stock play they were doing together. So at the last minute, we had to look for someone else. And thank the Lord, um, Robert Sean Leonard came in. Uh, he's just such a, a wonderful um, actor and so serious and so good with rehearsal and preparing the part. Um, but the problem was that we kept sort of changing the characters around and recasting and different things. So the poor, co I mean, for the costume designer, it was, it was really hellish. And I, I remember one point with all these changes going on in the shoot, um, people would come up to the line producer and just complain about how every, late everything was. And, and the, the line producer said one of the favorite lines was, stop complaining and start working, <laughs> which, which works a lot. So I think to myself often when I'm in a kind of complaining mood, stop complaining and start working. It, it works. <laughs> that is great advice. Uh, and the character of Dez, as well, played by Chris Eigeman, um, was he cast right off the top, just like Kate Beckinsale, or was that kind of a later in the casting process? Well, it was the Chris Eigeman part, so it's sort of written for, for Chris Eigeman. But we were under huge pressure to cast a star, to get bigger stars. And because the film was getting to cost a lot of money, we had to do it as a Warner Brothers film. So all the budgets went up to be a studio film because Castle Rock had been bought by Warner Brothers and they had to do everything union and everything expensive. And so we needed stars in it. And so there was a star, a big star, who really wanted to do the part and Castle Rock really wanted him to do it. And um, 
I mean, who, who could do the Chris Eigerman part better than Chris Eigerman? And so Chris and I talked about it because he also didn't want to get sort of typecast doing the same part all the time. And we decided to do it anyway. So he's in the film. And thank, thank heavens. Um, I also want to go back a little bit to the beginning where we were talking about how you're both a writer and a director. So for when you're kind of working on a project that has a very shortened lead time and you have a limited time to work on it, what does the pro the editing process look like for you? Well, um, generally it's the opposite. Generally we have unlimited time and, and no money. So uh, we can work on the script as long as we want because no one in the world wants to see the film. and. Uh, and, and you know, so, so a lot of starting filmmakers don't realize sort of, um, you know, no one wants to make their film. And the luxury they have, they can spend as much time preparing it as possible. And uh, it's very unusual. And the only case we had of this kind of hurry, hurry was with disco. Everything else, plenty of time. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, we, there are two editors involved, and I, I worked on it every day except for Christmas um, after we finished. And I look at the film, and I think it's still not really finished, but um, they say films aren't finished, they're abandoned. Uh, so it's abandoned at a certain point. Uh, but, but you know, over time, um, you think that some of the weaknesses in something you do, maybe it's too meandering, maybe it's too long. After a while, people get to like those things, too. You know, it's sort of unusual that it has all these plot twists and all that. And if you get the DVD, you can see other plot twists that are left out of the movie. Those are great, by the way. Um, I also wanted to talk about how so much of disco is related to the end of a cultural era, kind of w witnessing the end of a time. <clears throat> um, and you can easily relate that to New York, you know, disappearing club scenes, music, culture, even publishing a book. I mean, that's, you know, very increasingly d difficult now. Uh, do you think, in your humble opinion, do you think New York is over? No, um, I don't. <laughs> um, there was something that was sort of not true, which is, um, so the disco music that I love did sort of morph into something else that I also loved for a while, and then it kind of disappeared. Um, but the nightclub culture that came in with disco changed a little bit, but it kept on going. So we didn't go back to the wasteland, the, the uh, what is it, the, uh, um, the, the, they, they, I think they talked about the, the, the wasteland of non-dancing, the Woodstock era, the wasteland of the Woodstock era with no dancing in nightclubs. Um, we didn't go back to that. And I'm not sure where things are now. I think things have calmed down in the dancing scene, so far as I can see. I can't report back. I'm so sorry. Anyone know? Anyone know? Are there still dance clubs? Yeah. Still good? OK. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, well, maybe this is a good time to open it up to the audience as well. I just did want to say that uh, please wait until the mic comes to you. Okay, and I think our first question is oh. just over there. Uh, thank you. Um, Witt Stillman, I am, I'm a huge fan of your writing, and, uh, and thanks to this movie, this is where I found so many of my favorite musicians, too. So uh, I want to ask you, what was the most captivating, the most captivating thing to you about capturing this era of music in your film? Where were you? I can't see. Can you? Oh, you're there. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. And what was your question? Um, uh, what was the most captivating aspect of capturing this very era of music in your film? Well, there's one dance scene uh, I really like. Um, it is the big scene with Chloe and Kate dancing together. And then Robert Sean Leonard shows up and dances with um, with Chloe, and that's one of my favorite um, dance songs. It's um, it's a chic song that's not overexposed, and we had that sort of long tracking shot into them, and it really sort of tells a story because you know she's lost contact with him, then he shows up, and there's this sort of false thread love story that we have at the beginning of the film. Um, I think that um, sort of a story behind that is that we had thought of having professional dancers um, augmenting the 
sort of actors and extras doing our kind of club dancing, which isn't very elaborate. And um, they really wrecked so many shots because they'd sort of come in and do this very sort of what looked to us very artificial. So it was this constant thing as we did takes of that. I said, actually, um, could you, you know, step over here for this, this scene? And so we had to remove like all the, almost all the professional dancers from that scene to have it look real. And it was a good thing because we had booked them in to our budget. We we're going over a budget with the film and we'd bo booked professional dancers into the budget all over the place. And we said, okay, we'll get rid of, get rid of all that and, you know, save all that money and put it somewhere else. Because that was my sort of favorite um, musical and dance scene in the movie. I mean, we're trying to sort of change people's idea of disco. And I think the really great part of disco came out of the soul music from Philadelphia from the early 70s, the Philly sound, um, Gamble and Hoff um, and Tom Bell, um, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. And so in setting it in 81, 82, we could use the very late sort of Euro disco songs, like the last song in the club, um, Dolce Vita, that was very big in Europe and sort of goes to that scene. And we could have the very early things that are sort of pre-disco dance songs, very much soul and, and sort of change the idea that people would have of that music. Okay, over here. Oh, sorry, just wait till the mic comes to you. Can we bring a mic down here? We'll just shout it out and I'll repeat it. Thank you so much for giving us a brief glimpse of Audrey again, uh, especially looking so self-assured and elegant, but that wasn't what I was going to say. My main thing is, um, it's so fascinating to hear that you started with words and your words are so wonderful, but at the same time, one of the things I notice about your work is that you have such a strong, powerful sense of specific place. There's so much atmosphere and significance to the places and, and the visual atmospheres of the places that you create. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that. You were one of the dancers last night, right? Yes. OK. <laughs> so we have a, an authentic Jane Austen dancer um, asking questions. <laughs> and so what you mentioned were Audrey from Metropolitan, along with uh, Charlie from Metropolitan in one scene. And then we have, um, in another scene, we have Sally and uh, Fred from Metropolitan. And she's talking about her musical preferences of The Clash or something like that, that I don't know anything about. Um, and then we also have Taylor Nichols in another role playing his Barcelona character before he breaks up with his then girlfriend. And so one of the sort of conceits in Last Days of Disco is it unites the two other films we did, Metropolitan and Barcelona. Because one of the aspects of a super popular nightclub like that is you run into people you haven't seen for ages. Everyone's going there. So it's, it's this magnet of everyone you know from different aspects of life. And so that was interesting. Now, the idea of the sense of place, um, thank you for mentioning that, because we really care about the geography and, and how things look and, and you know, authentic things of, of the things. And making five films in over many years, you get a lot of time to think about where you want it set and you know, what things you want to show. And so I think as much as possible, you want to sort of immerse people in the experience you know about. And um, I'm not so aware of it that much in this film. But in other films, it was really great being able to get something that we knew was going to disappear. So in Barcelona, we have a scene at the TWA ticket booth right before TWA went bankrupt and disappeared. So we have period TWA. Um, uh, you know, people and all that. And in, in Metropolitan, we have a lot of places. So we, the old Scribner's bookstore was uh, iconic and it had already been sold and it was that moment of Brentano's. And then quickly thereafter, it became a Sephora. So we were able to capture in each of the films many of these places that were quickly disappearing. Um, so it's really great to do the sort of period film while it's happening. Here in Toronto, you could do the same thing. It seems like things disappear every 10 seconds. Every 10 seconds. <laughs> Next question. Um, here. Okay, all the way at the top. Hi, um, I'm one of the people who have seen it before. And um, it was, I'd forgotten the characters in Metropolitan had shown up in it. 
I was wondering, have you ever thought about revisiting some of these characters, either from Last Days of Disco or Metropolitan or Barcelona, perhaps? Well, that's an interesting question, because I was just talking to someone who has some money to do sort of a short scene or do some short. And um, in the novel, based on Last Days of Disco, it's called The Last Days of Disco with Cocktails of Petrosi, and afterwards, um, the actor, we, we, used, we showed our rough cuts at the screening room at the, at, at the um, Planet Hollywood in New York. And so we have a last chapter in the novel where the actual characters from the film, you know, the real people, not the actors played, played in the film, come and see a, a screening of the film. And then they have cocktails at the Petrosian restaurant, another thing that's recently disappeared. Um, and and sort of talk about it. So I thought of having doing something maybe with the, these characters and maybe these actors coming to sort of play play that. And um, if the Cosmopolitan's TV series um, goes ahead in spirit, it'll be continuing a lot of these things. But it will be uh, it'll have Chloe, um, but it will be different characters. But thanks for that question. Hi. Um, I guess I'm, my question is, uh, I find your dialogue very open and direct and almost kind of positive in this movie. I'm just wondering what inspired that, uh, if that makes I any sense. I hate Lady and the Tramp. <laughs> <laughs> really bothers me. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's good to be able to take things you actually think that are, that are absurd and, and make them into sort of comic scenes. So, uh, you know, it seems ridiculous, but that's what I really think about it. And so, um, so you know, you, you, with, when everything takes so long, you get to sort of, um, you know, develop this material. And I have to get in this thing of not sitting in front of a computer. I guess other writers have discovered this. You only get ideas when you're not sitting in front of the computer. The last place to get a good idea is in front of your laptop. And so I've got, you know, I think writers have to do more walking and less typing. Very true. OK, I think we have time for a few more. Um, OK, so. Front or right there? Running. Oh, thank you. Uh, what I just wanted to ask you, um, first of all, like how deeply satisfying is it to get that response from your audience when you hear people laugh? And it, it seems like it would be easy, but obviously it's not. I mean, I'm thinking back to like comedy directors that I grew up with, like Blake Edwards, you know, the master. And I mean, I think you slot right in there. And I have to selfishly admit that the best time I've ever had at a movie <laughs> was watching Damsels in Distress a few years back because I had to wait to pick up my sister to drive her home for Thanksgiving. I had a two-hour slot to fill, and I went and sat in a theater with, unfortunately, about four other people at the Yorkdale Cinemas at a mall just up uh, north end of the city. That and sounds about right for that release. It, but you know what? I'll be honest to God. I did not We wanted to give people a lot of room. Yeah, oh, I, well, I, I did not stop laughing the entire time. It's one of the best times I've seriously ever had watching a movie. And every time somebody asks me, hey, have you seen a funny movie lately? I say, watch Damsels in Distress, best ever. So thank you personally. Thanks very much. Because that film had a kind of hard ride, and I, I really like it, <laughs> I have to say. So uh, thank you very much for saying that. Uh, um, the thing is, it's really nice having a screening like this now because generally, most of the time we have screenings, it's right when a film is coming out, and um, we're really anxious about, you know, maybe the reviews haven't come out yet, and maybe a lot of people don't know what they're going to be seeing and are not going to like it, and uh, and a lot of people go to the bathroom and don't come back, um, and so it's really nice having a film once sort of people know what it's about and they really can enjoy it in a relaxed way, and I can enjoy it in a relaxed way. So thank you for saying that. So I think this will be our last question for the night. Or not. <laughs> or not. Uh, I think in the front right there. Uh, I saw this film the, the night it opened. Wow. And uh, I told people about it a lot. It took a while. And they've all seen it now. But um, <clears throat> that night, um, when the film ended, Everybody was standing up to leave, and they kind of messed up what I think is the most beautiful scene, which is <clears throat> the subway scene. 
Yeah. Which is kind of weird because it's not really a disco song, um, <clears throat> but it's beautiful and it's sexy. Not like Scrooge McDuck. <clears throat> but um, I just Love wondered, train. <laughs> wondered where that came from because it's such a, um, such a great rap to the film. Well, um, it was a very odd thing with popular music. So I was listening to soul music in the 60s and late 60s. And then suddenly around 1970, it seemed like there was no more good soul music. I didn't hear it at all. It just was sort of pop music. And it wasn't until I went to live in um, Barcelona and listened to the Nostalgia radio station, the oldies radio station in Barcelona, I started hearing all these things from the early 70s, from the Philly soul, like, like the OJ singing Love Train. And I just absolutely loved them. And I just was, went wild for all this music and started to study as much as possible. And it is not exactly disco, but it's the music the disco came out of. It's the really the, the roots of it, the great roots of it. And um, these same people then went more into sort of out and out dance. And that was wonderful. And it was really frustrating, I think, when the film came out in France. I'd moved to France then, and I was in the back of the um, press screening. And you know, seeing people rush out at the end before that scene, and that was my favorite scene. And uh, it's dangerous, you know, um, putting your favorite scene with the credits. Um, but I think people have learned actually so many films, you know, greatly improve in the in the end credits these days um, that people sort of learn to maybe pay attention to that. Anyway, thanks very much to all of you for coming, and thanks for the Toronto Film Festival. You're international, right? It's Toronto we are international, international Film Festival, and yes. I am I am part of the international. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> if we can call it that. So thank you very much, and thanks for coming. Thank you. <clears throat>